Uh, David first appears, of course, as a boy, uh, and his, uh, he first appears as a musician who is brought into the court of Saul after a spirit has departed from Saul and Saul is left plagued by the, uh, by the evil spirit. And David is brought in to play the harp and to dispel the evil spirit. Um, that would be important for thinking about uh, David and Solomon's achievement, especially as, as it's presented in the Chronicles, where music is a very central part of what the, what the temple is about and what worship is about uh, in, the, in the monarchy era. Uh, but he's first presented as a musician doing battle with his hands and with his fingers, uh, doing battle with music against evil spirits. Uh, even though he's not of age to be part of the army, that means he's less than 20, uh, he's uh, uh, present at the battle when Goliath appears, overcomes Goliath. This is another um, man versus Nakash kind of situation, although Goliath is not called a serpent. Uh, he's dressed in scale armor, which is the, the language that's used for uh, scaly creatures in the uh, law that, laws that talk about uh, uh, unclean foods. Um, so he, he uh, uh, likes, like uh, Saul, he begins with overcoming a, a serpent-like figure uh, and defeating him. That brings David into Saul's uh, entourage more permanently, and he eventually becomes Saul's armor bearer. Uh, but that creates, a, um, creates the dynamic that takes up much of the second half of 1 Samuel, which is the conflict between Saul and David. Um, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And that arouses Saul's envy at uh, this young upstart, uh, this young man who's getting more plaudits than he has. And um, for much of, the, uh, much of uh, 1 Samuel, Saul is Saul's main main goal is to eliminate David. Uh, I, um, when I was work, working on uh, my commentary on Samuel, uh, it uh, occurred to me, I, I don't know if it was at that time or later as I became older, uh, that I realized that this is a, this is a syndrome uh, or a complex. You got your Oedipus complex. You, know, you got your Oedipus complex. No, you, I'm not saying you have your Oedipus complex. <laughs> There's such a thing as an Oedipus complex. There's also a Saul syndrome, which is uh, the aging ruler who is envious of the young, successful um, protege even. It's kind of, if you know Rene Girard's work, this is a typical Girardian kind of situation where uh, somebody who's been, who's modeled after his mentor becomes a rival to his mentor. Uh, certainly the mentor can see him as a rival. Uh, and I think there's a, um, there's a, a profound psychological insight in the way that Saul, uh, in thinking about the way Saul reacts to David, that's, uh, that's uh, as, a, uh, as, an aging, uh, as an aging man, uh, I, I see this uh, in myself. You've got, um, my lifespan has uh, become a lot shorter over the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, I look at other people, younger people who have a lifespan that has an additional 30 years and, uh, and they're doing things that I wish I could have done. I mean, that's, that's, the, kind of, uh, that's the kind of dynamic and the, uh, the uh, temptation that seduces uh, people to become like Saul. So Saul spends a lot of his time chasing David. Uh, it's important to recognize that David never, ever does Saul ill. He never does anything to harm Saul. Everything he does in, is, in, is the opposite. Uh, he is doing what Jesus, he's kind of a, uh, of, all, of all characters in the Bible, he's the one who most fulfills the instructions of the Sermon on the Mount, who loves his enemies, who turns his cheek uh, when he's slapped, uh, who continues to do good to those who hate him. He's piling up those burning coals on Saul's head, whatever that, whatever that might mean. Uh, because he never does anything to harm Saul. He has opportunities to kill Saul a couple of times. He doesn't do it. Uh, Saul comes into the cave, and David could, uh, could take him out while he's in the cave. Saul is in a vulnerable position because he's covering his feet in the cave. Uh, that's, uh, he's, uh, 
Um, that's a, uh, some kind of a biblical euph euphemism for urination or defecation. He's, he's relieving himself in the cave. Uh, David could take advantage of that. Uh, David does cut off the wing of his garment and then is stri stricken in conscience and confronts Saul. He has that opportunity. Uh, he sneaks into Saul's camp at night on another occasion uh, with uh, Joab's brothers. Uh, Abishai is with him. And Abishai says, uh, let's take him out. Saul's asleep with his spear stuck next to him. He's, he's again, completely vulnerable. Uh, and David not only refrains from attacking Saul himself, but he guards Saul uh, from Abishai's attack. Uh, and at, uh, in the aftermath, he's, uh, this is why Abner is still alive. Abner is Saul's uh, captain. Uh, and uh, in the morning, David confronts Abner. He shouts out to the camp and uh, basically says, Abner, I'm, I'm a better guard than you are. Uh, you weren't guarding the king very well because I snuck in and, you know, He'd take a jug out of the camp. He had some evidence that he'd been in the camp. Uh, and he'd actually, he had actually protected Saul from, uh, from Abishai, and Abner had not. I think the, 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 uh, the lesson that David gets, so the, the long chapter in the middle of this that doesn't, where Saul doesn't appear in 1 Samuel 25, which is the story of Nabal, uh, the fool. Uh, and I think the, the thrust of that whole chapter, the reason why it's set the way it placed it is, uh, it's between uh, the scene in the cave and the scene in the camp. Those two scenes where David has a chance to kill Saul and doesn't stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed, and he doesn't do it. And the story of Nabal is right in the middle of that. Uh, and David's initial reaction to Nabal uh, is to take vengeance against Nabal and wipe out his house because he's been he's been protecting Nabal's um, Nabal's uh, flocks. He's been a wall around Nabal's property. And yet when he asks for provisions, Nabal won't help him. And so David is ready to take vengeance against him. Uh, Abigail comes out, Nabal's wife, pleads with David. David turns back and doesn't carry out the vengeance. And the Lord, the Lord takes out Nabal. Uh, as his wine is going out of him, uh, his heart stops within him and he dies. Uh, in 1 Samuel 25. That's the lesson uh, of Nabal is a lesson that he's learning with Saul. He doesn't have to seize the kingdom. He doesn't have to seize the crown. He doesn't even have to cut off a little bit of his robe. That's an attack on the royal robes, which is a kind of symbolic attack on the, the king himself. He doesn't have to do any of that. He just uh, faithfully serves Saul. Uh, he does Saul good, and the Lord will eliminate him in his time, and David will ascend to the throne. That's what the Lord promised. David just has to trust the Lord that he's going to give, that, give him that... Uh, uh, that position when the Lord is ready and when He's uh, uh, when He's gone through these various tests. So um, yeah, David no, does nothing evil, even when he leaves the land and goes off and lives in Ziklag. Uh, eventually, uh, David decides he needs to get out of the uh, get out of the land. If he stays in the land, Saul's going to catch up with him, and Saul's going to kill him. So he goes into exile, uh, and that sets up a, uh, something we'll look at in more detail. But it sets up a kind of um, exile and return, exile, exodus, conquest uh, pattern in David's life. He goes into the uh, region of the Philistine city of Gath uh, and becomes a um, part of the army of Achish, king of Gath. Gath is Goliath's hometown. Ga Goliath is a, hit, a Gittite. Uh, Gittite is a resident of Gath. And now David shows up in Goliath's hometown uh, and Achish, king of Gath, uh, basically hires him and gives him a city. As Pharaoh gave Israel a uh, Goshen, he gives him a city, Ziklag, and that becomes David's, uh, David's uh, place in exile. Everybody who's disaffected with Saul starts migrating, so there's a, a growing population in Ziklag. But even when David is in exile, he's out of the land, he still uh, is doing Saul's work. He's doing the stuff that Saul has failed to do, uh, he goes out and attacks Israel's enemies during the day, and he comes back, and Achish asks him what he's been doing, and he, uh, he uh, uh, acts like he's been attacking Achish's enemies, Philistine enemies. When He's not attacking Philistines, but he's attacking all the other people that have been plaguing Israel. He's, he's protecting the land in a way that Saul isn't, um, even when he's in exile, even when Saul has completely chased him out of the land, he's still doing, Saul's, he's do, still doing good for Saul. Um, 
He's a, he's a Joseph kind of character. Uh, he's, uh, he's oppressed, abused by those who are over him. Uh, he has to uh, flee from the land, and uh, yet the Lord preserves him and eventually gives him back the land, uh, gives, him, gives him the land. So he initially comes back to the land. Saul dies. Again, David doesn't have anything to do with that. Uh, the Philistines are the ones who kill Saul. Uh, and David returns to the land. Initially, he's ruling over uh, just, the, just Judah uh, and a couple of smaller associated tribes. Uh, and he's in the midst of a, of a civil war with the house of Saul. So there's an ongoing conflict with, between Saul and David. Uh, I won't uh, take you there right now, but if you look at the outline, the chiastic outline, you'll see the two sides of the death of Saul. There's the conflict between David and Saul, and then there's a conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. Those are, those are right at the, toward the center of the book of Samuel. Uh, so David doesn't initially become king over all Israel, but eventually the house of, Saul, the house of David rises, the house of Saul diminishes. Uh, Saul's son Ishbosheth is killed in his bed, and then David uh, is asked to become king over all the tribes, and he becomes king. Um, uh, that's um, a third of the way through Second, uh, second Samuel. Uh, and we have a couple of chapters of David's, David uh, ruling, uh, conquering various enemies around Israel, showing mercy to Mephibosheth, uh, the son of Jonathan, grandson of Saul, uh, and then Bathsheba. Um, and the story of Bathsheba begins in 2 Samuel 10. Um, with it, it's, Bathsheba is not introduced until the following chapter, but it's the, the battle with the Ammonites that's the setting for that sin. David is not, David is not taking, carrying out his responsibilities as king because he's not out on the battlefield. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, after that, um, uh, he's, uh, his house, the sword doesn't, doesn't depart from his house. That's part of the curse. Uh, he remains king, uh, but his house is full of turmoil. Uh, and he eventually is he's driven out of the land again, this time by his son instead of his father-in-law, uh, by Absalom. Uh, and he returns to the land, but as we'll see uh, if we have time to look at it, even when he returns to the land, he's uh, n never again the king that he was at the, uh, toward the beginning. Uh, the sin with Bathsheba takes the wind out of his sails, and he's, uh, he's uh, significantly weakened by that, uh, by that event. Uh, that, takes us, that takes us to the end of 2 Samuel. We have the couple of poems at the end of 2 Samuel and the story of the census that I talked about this morning. Uh, and that's where 2 Samuel ends. David's still alive at the beginning of Kings. Uh, David is on his deathbed in the first couple of chapters of Kings. And then there's struggle for the succession between uh, Solomon and Adonijah. Um, but that's, that's the basic outline of David's life. Uh, youthful success, the jealousy of Saul, Saul's conflict with David, David's exile and return. Uh, a few chapters about David being a successful king and then everything, uh, everything goes badly with Bathsheba and Uriah and in the aftermath.